Howdy me and welcome to the Meeple Syrup Show. So welcome to the Meeple Syrup Show. We have with us today John Bridger um, and he is going to talk to us about all sorts of cool stuff. Uh, Jesse, why don't you introduce John for us? Uh, I wasn't ready for this. Um, so, uh, <laughs> John, so I, I know John because he's always uh, hanging out at the local playtesting events here in San Francisco Bay Area. Bumming around, right? Yeah, just hanging around. And, now he's <laughs> yeah. kind of like, and then he started running them, and it was like, who is this guy? Why does he think he's so important? And it turns out um, he recently, I think about a year ago, made the sort of leap of faith into a full-time industry guy. And, uh, and so that, I imagine, means he wears a lot of hats. I know that he's a developer. I know he does some design work. And I specifically wanted to bring him on because I think what he does uh, with playtesting is really cool. And I wanted to grill him on air when he couldn't run away. Uh, so um, John, why don't you uh, help, help us all get a better sense of who you are and what you do in the industry? Yeah. Oh, oh good. I'm, well, I'm looking forward to being being grilled on air. I'm John Brieger. I am a freelance board game developer. So, uh, you know, obviously some people who are on this cast have worked as developers too. But if anyone is, is watching, uh, a developer takes a, a prototype or a concept from a publisher and refines that prototype game into the final product for the publisher. Uh, and that can encompass a lot of different things from playtesting, uh, mechanical tweaks, balance changes, up to pretty major product development uh, component ideas, really forming the game into the product that's going to come to market. Uh, so I work freelance for a lot of little indie publishers. Uh, so uh, Thunderworks Games, who make role player, um, b and &B games, Final Frontier games, a couple of others. Mostly my clients tend to be smaller, so kind of two to five person companies who are growing but they're not quite at the point where they're ready to bring on a full another full-time employee. So they hire a contractor like me. Awesome. And what are some uh, recent projects that you've worked on? Uh, so I re recently, I just wrapped up Cartographers, a role player tale for Thunderworks games. And that's a really, really cool map building game. Uh, it's a roll and write with player interaction. Um, and that's available for pre-order right now. And if you pre-order it, you get a really cool mini expansion that I designed that uses the skills from the role player base game in kind of a new way. Um, and let me see if I can drop a link to that. Oh, I, dropped, I, I dropped it in the comments already, so. Okay, oh, good, sure. I, I just realized I don't think we have access to the comments. <laughs> Okay, there I don't it think is. it ever occurred to me, but it's we don't. Right, it's right there now, no, down there. I can, I can see it, it I can't write on it though. No, oh, so sorry, anybody's commenting. I, I, I just realized that. <laughs> sorry, right. guys, I'm a little slow. That's okay. Uh, so yeah, and and then like Jesse mentioned, I do a lot of playtesting in the Bay Area, both running some of the designer meetups and then also just attending everything I can under the sun now. Uh, <laughs> so that's how, how Jesse and I met. And I also write a lot about playtesting on, on Twitter and some other places. Um, you know, talking about how to maybe play test a little more effectively or, or some tips from my own experience. And so. Perfect. And we'll, that's we'll get you to plug that. Yeah. yeah. I was saying, we'll definitely get you to plug that later. Well, I mean, we'll have the conversation, but obviously people who want to follow, cause you give, is it daily tips? Uh, you, you every, every weekday tips, now. Right? Yeah. Okay. okay. So there's going to be people who are definitely going to want to follow hey, that. Is, so we'll make sure. And that's on your Twitter it. feed? Yeah, the, um, the play testing tip of the day is on my Twitter feed. And what's your Twitter handle? Uh, that is uh, twitter.com slash at Das Brieger, D-A-S-B-R-I-E-G-E-R. -E um, and I'm dropping that in the comments as well right now. Yeah, we should do that. <laughs> we can make um, it clickable. <laughs> there we go. Perfect. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah, John's able to type in there, so that's good. And I just typed it too. So we've got a lot of stuff going on with John, which is wonderful. Um, we've got some development. Um, I, I noticed in your Twitter feed, under your you know description, it says design researcher. Yeah. So tell me a little bit what, about that. That's what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, so part of kind of my 
entry into the board game industry comes from my background as a as a designer and design researcher in the retail space. So okay. uh, looking at the way that customers would experience retail stores, whether that's part of their buying experience or their browsing experience, their interactions with employees, and then studying that in a way to improve the design of the store to improve the the customer's experience. And so there's actually a very deep body of knowledge on this kind of qualitative experiential research for product design uh, that's generally labeled design research. Uh, so most you know major software companies or major product companies are going to have design researchers or user experience researchers who are going to study the way customers approach the product and use the results of those studies to iterate the design. Cool. I, um, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, uh, so yeah, so I, I used to work for Apple uh, researching on their stores. So uh, mostly my focus is on installations and kind of big immersive experiences, lots right. of kind of physical interactive things. And I was working on board games on the side. And even while I was still doing board games very much as a hobby, one of the things that I noticed is that there was such a huge disconnect between the way products are professionally made in industries that aren't board games and the way board games are tend to be made. I don't, I, not all of them, but tend to be made. And that's, it's both a good and a bad this. thing. This is, yeah, I wanna hear more about this. <laughs> like what is um, the distinctive difference? Cause coming from other industries, it's always interesting to look at yeah. gaming and say, oh, you're doing this really well, or why are you guys doing this? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it, and I think it's important to stress that it's it's not that anyone is doing anything wrong, right? Uh, it's, just different. It's, yeah. it's just different. And so I think for me, there's in many ways, the board game industry isn't as professionalized uh, of an industry yeah. yet. I and agree. And because of that, that it has a really good benefit, which is it's really easy to break into the board game industry, right? You can get started and there's not a lot of barriers to entry, but it also means that there's not necessarily well-known best practices about how to do things. Uh, it means that people cut a lot of corners, uh, sometimes in, in places that I don't think they should be cutting corners, uh, like research ethics. Uh, and it means that there's not a lot of uh, kind of formalism to the process, right? People kind of tend to make their own process and find the process that works for them, uh, which, as I said, both good and bad. Wait, can we I, can we go back? Yeah, to this elaborate. <laughs> I elaborate I on that one. You what did does that. that mean? Yeah, I'm trying to get out of the academy so that I can get away from research ethics, and you're telling me I need to keep it with me. Uh, yeah. So you know, obviously, this is this is you know Jesse's whole whole world in in lots of ways. So. Uh, you know, and I don't want to hold myself out there as an, an ethics expert, but it's important to know that when we are we're play, we're making a product, right? We most of the time when we are playtesting a game, we are running product tests, and it turns out that there's actually a lot of important ethical considerations you have to be thinking about when you're running a, a test of a product that you're intending to make money on with a group of real people, right? Uh, are you in any way materially contributing to harm to your players, right? So uh, is the, the content of your product potentially uh, going to give them harm? And I think a lot of people aren't thinking about those things because they, they think of physical harm, right? And they're like, oh, well, you know, my, my board game doesn't have any small pieces and I don't play test with children. So like, there's not a choking hazard. People aren't gonna cut themselves playing my game. Like there's no risk to players. Uh, but there's a lot of psychological and emotional risk that you can have like product testing. Trigger kind of ideas? Right, so you might have uh, content that's potentially uh, triggering of someone who has uh, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder or even mm. just a, a traumatic event in their past. Uh, so you know, if you're play testing a game that has serious themes or adult content, that's something that you might need to be warning players in advance about. Mm. Uh, or, you know, uh, things like testing with children, right? Uh, anytime you're running any product test with children, um, you need to be getting informed consent, which maybe I should have, I should have maybe led with the the concept of informed consent in play testing. Um, but I think I think there's a lot of designers who are who are going about things kind of thinking that nothing bad will happen and aren't prepared for, uh, you know, what would happen if 
uh, you know, a, a parent came by and was incredibly angry that you were play testing a consumer product to their child uh, without their permission, right? And the designer just isn't thinking about that because it doesn't occur to them that that's an eventuality. Uh, yeah. And as the industry grows, it's going to start happening more and more. And I've already seen examples of some of these things in, in my own testing with designers. So I, I feel like the, the example that probably everybody has seen is the way people uh, just take photos and then share them on social media. Yeah. Right? Yeah, uh, of other people's stuff. And other people. Like yeah. other people playing your game, just taking a photo of everybody at the table. Oh, without, without again, without that. that permission. Yeah. Right. Um, so, so that's kind of the, one of the big things that I have been trying to, to stress in, uh, you know, my, my own content and in, uh, and in, you know, articles I write and, you know, and appearances like this, right. Is the, uh, the idea that we have a responsibility to our players as, as moderators, as facilitators of play tests. And that that comes with qu questions that we have to ask ourselves. Right. And it's not that there's necessarily going to be a set process, but there's lots of things that you need to be thinking about as a as a designer or as a playtest moderator uh, to make sure that you're keeping your players safe and that you're living up to that responsibility. Hmm. Very That's a really good warning. I think I think you're absolutely right, because most designers you meet, this is not necessarily their full time job. This is something they're doing just for the fun of it, that they're not really thinking about maybe the legal or as you said ethical implications of actions yeah um and and you know i think the most the thing is most people tend to do a pretty good job right and you could you could run hundreds of play tests and and never really have uh, a serious issue uh but it doesn't mean that you're never going to have one right that's fair Again, I think this is things that need to be said, but doesn't necessarily things that people naturally think about. Um, question from the audience. Sorry, I didn't know if Sam was going to pick it up, which is why I hesitated. Nope. Um, so David Tome is asking, so while the goal is to help protect or help, how is this added burden minimized on the designers, on the designers to do things they have done for, quote, years? Um. So I, I would say that just because you've done things the same way for a long time doesn't mean that that's necessarily the right way to do things. Um, and I think part of it is as uh, you know, members of the community, right? If you're out there running your own tests and you're out there participating in maybe tests for other people, uh, you want to be, I kind of look at it as an opportunity to kind of push a cultural shift in, in design. Uh, so, you know, I, I recently played in a playtest from another designer where after the game ended, they uh, immediately pulled out their phone and began recording all of the participants. And I didn't notice. And we had a we had like a 15 minute discussion. And then I noticed that there, the, there was a phone on the table recording everything we'd said. And uh, I, you know, I waited and I paused the discussion. I said, you know, just so you know, I'm OK with you recording this discussion. But, you know, it, it really bothers me that you started recording this without our consent. And that could run you into some serious issues down the road. Uh, and I'd appreciate it if in the future, you didn't record me without asking me first, right? And so that's, I think I, it's on us as members of the community to kind of challenge the, the practices that people have kind of fallen into when those practices have the, have the potential to, to harm other players who are participating as volunteers. No, it's, I think these are really good warnings for people just to think about. Like, it, it's almost a common courtesy thing, but it's not common until people are aware of it, right? So um, I think this is a really good one to say, you know, when we're playtesting, a lot of times we do want to take pictures of people or the game in action or, you know, we're taking notes on people. But we forget sometimes that you do need permission because this is somebody else's opinion, voice, visual, whatever it is. Mm hmm um, and it, I mean, it's interesting. We could, you could, uh, <clears throat> perhaps, if you have people notified and they sign a waiver that says, you know, everybody in this area will be, could be taking pictures and recording, blah 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 blah. That's a, another possibility that you could do. Um, and it's 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 sort of just like the price of entry, um, but it's something that, that has to be informed, right? I think that's yeah. the point. I think this actually might be a good thing that if there was such thing as, I don't know if there's like a standard version of this, but sort of like 
an information release that we can even provide to our community to say, hey, just to maybe start implementing the practice, this might be something you wanna put in front of your play testers before you start. Well, there's definitely photo releases. I know that a lot of places, a lot of conventions yeah. will have photo release that you automatically by buying a ticket to their convention, release the rights for the convention to take pictures of whatever, of you in the space, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then I do know that most people, most, most play testers actually probably are much more ethical than the designers. <laughs> they will ask us to, you know, always, oh, if I'm allowed to take pictures. Yeah, we're trying to yeah. take a picture of that. And we often will announce that at the beginning of the play test nights, like, hey, just make sure before you take a picture and post it to social media that the designer is okay with you doing that. Because a lot of times, you know, it might be private information or there might be NDAs involved or blah, 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 blah. So, um, they're yeah. usually more equipped than the designers are in a lot of ways. Yeah, and I and I think it's important to also, you know, kind of separate like the the legal aspects come from some some of the ethical aspects, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I'm not saying that every, you know, uh, there's a question like, does everyone need to sign a contract before they they play a game? Well, that gives both legal and ethical protection. I, you know, I'm fine. Uh, ethically with saying, hey, is everyone all right if I take a photo of this and I'll probably post it to social media and I get a verbal yes from all the players at the table, that to me meet, meets the standards of, of informed consent, right? So we have with the consent part, are people okay with me taking the photo? And then we have the informed thing, which is me telling you what the purpose of the photo is. Uh, and so, you know, I think people assume that it always has to be something very formal, but there's there's lots of informal ways that you can use mm -hmm. this and still have it feel like a, a natural, um, you know, natural part of your playtesting process. Yeah. I, I think I think a good point that, because uh, David was bringing up the idea of something like an unpub where you're kind of expecting that you're showing up to playtest in the first place or a designer night or something like that. Uh, at least with the terms of a convention, you are usually signing a photo release to begin with. So I would hope on that level, just saying, hey, is there anyone who did not approve the photo release <laughs> at this table? No, okay, we kind of know what's going on. But I think anything outside of that, you probably want to get, as you're saying, just that kind of like, yes, I'm okay with you doing this. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things I've actually been looking at is I run a couple playtesting events in the Bay Area, and I'm looking at uh, establishing a code of conduct for my playtesting events, similar to the way that uh, conventions have codes of conduct that right. help set baselines for designers uh, about asking about some of these things and similar. Yeah. So yeah. on, on the topic of playtesting, to get us uh, moving into some of the other things that you could speak a lot about, um, the main reason why I wanted to have you on is because I think it's really cool that you use sort of ethnographic or ethnographic light methods in your playtesting. Um, and so I'd like to invite you to take the opportunity to, to tell us a bit about the sort of social science research tools that you use in development and playtesting um, and how those make you an awesome developer. Uh, yeah, so ethnographic uh, ethnographic research is a qualitative research discipline kind of rooted in anthropology uh, that's used across a lot of different industries. So uh, the idea here is that we are uh, watching uh, behavior and and trying to understand the, the motivations behind that behavior and, and really uh, empathize with and understand our players. And so what's interesting also, because Jesse and I play test together fairly frequently, is that the techniques that I use in at a play testing meetup where I'm running tests with other designers or other developers are not necessarily the ethnographic techniques that I use when I'm with real consumers. Uh, and so that's kind of step one. Ooh, we may have like a little bug here. Oh, oh. lost in Erica. That's okay. She'll come back. I hope. Um, uh, but so, you know, so step step one for me is I'm changing the way that I run my tests based off of who is testing them and what, I, what I'm trying to learn, right? There's different ways to run a play test. And so it's not that there's one process and I'm like, this is the process and everyone should follow it. It's more that you need to uh, be thinking about your process and tailoring that process for the goals that you have in testing. Uh, so there's a lot of different techniques uh, kind of packed into that. 
Uh, so for example, you know, we talk about uh, blind testing, right? Blind testing is uh, when you, is typically when you're giving your players the rule set, right? And you send them a box and uh, they, you know, they play the game with no interaction with the designer at all. Uh, one of the techniques I use quite a bit is what I call semi-blind testing, which is I give them the box and kind of a brief set of kind of framing instructions. Uh, so, you know, imagine a friend has given you this game as a gift and I hand them the box. Uh, all you know is that it's a, you know, one to 99 player about make game about making fantasy maps. Uh, what I'd love you to do is learn the game from the rules and everything that is in the box is what would really come in the box other than that there's one rule book per player. Uh, and then I get them into what we call a think aloud protocol where I have them voice their thoughts out loud as they go through the rule book. Uh, and as they start playing the game. So they're, they're commenting out loud about uh, what they're experiencing and why they're doing the things they're doing with minimal interaction from me. And so that's, that's kind of, a, one of one of many techniques that's used in these kind of qualitative research studies that I think is really helpful for board games. Mm -hmm. um, and, the, you know, and so there's, there's lots of little things like that that you can kind of take into your studies to get different kinds of data. Because one of the things I see a lot with uh, designers and with a lot of playtesting guides, if you look at materials that are out there from uh, designers, many of whom are, are more experienced designers than me, is uh, they focus a lot on what to ask playtesters at the end of the session. And they don't talk a lot about the process of really running and facilitating the play of the game itself and what kinds of data you should be collecting by observing play. And really, the game happens while people are playing it. And so my view is you should be getting the majority of your data observationally mm -hmm. and then not by any sort of question or answer or self-report at the end. I, I put completely agree. Um, in my background as a therapist and a psychology person, um, that's exactly what I do. I mean, I still debrief at the end because I, I, there is, there's some value there, uh, but I, I know that's not where I'm getting the bulk of my data from, uh, to be honest at all. So what are the what are some of the behavioral cues or moments or actions or things that players do during a test that you're particularly attentive to and what do they tell you about the game? Uh, so so things I'm I'm especially looking for uh, I'm looking for moments of engagement, both positive engagement and negative engagement. Uh, so things that make players really angry or frustrated, right? That's negative engagement. Um, things that make players uh, happy or excited. Uh, so some cues that might be verbal exclamations like, right, or like, ah, or yes, right, or uh, hand motions. Uh, I don't know if I'm vertical or horizontal right now, but uh, so, you know, I'm just waving my, my arms in the air. Uh, players leaning into the table versus back from the table. Uh, you know, uh, there's two poses, and we'll see if I can mimic them correctly here, right? So we have, like, hand on chin, right? Like, this is this is thinking, and this is, oh, my God. <laughs> Like hand, like hand on face. Like stop um, <laughs> face, face, face palm versus chin stroke. Mm. Yeah, and so there's a lot of things that are at their surface very similar. Like it's it, it's really easy to mistake this one for this one, but they 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 communicate very different tones and emotion. And one of the things I want to mention is body language is not an exact science, and there's a lot of cultural cues embedded into it too. So like some of those things might only apply for, you know, Western audiences. But uh, in general, like I, I'm, I'm looking for what are the things that players are really excited about doing? Uh, okay. And what are the players that are, what are the moments that are causing them uh, boredom or frustration? And then boredom, boredom is a hard one, right? Because it's not like some one thing says, happens and then the players are like, oh, I'm bored, right? Uh, so I'm looking at actually for pacing throughout the game. So when are th different types of events uh, occurring? And then trying to kind of aggregate that data to say, okay, it looks like players are like starting to get bored around the, the third round of this game, right? They spend the first round learning the game. They play the second round. And by the time it gets to the third round, they're like, oh, done everything I need to do. So, you know, I'm watching for when players check their phones, when they put their head in their hands. Um, little things like that can give you a lot of clues about how players are responding emotionally to different elements of your game. Oh, so we almost need to make like a body body um, uh, behavior checklist. 
Yeah, I mean, you can. It's it's just not really. It's more oh, it's of not going to be <laughs> yes. Yeah, but it's almost kind of like if you've seen enough of certain behaviors going either on the positive or negative side, and you weren't necessarily able to gauge yourself how you thought you was doing, you could almost quantitative like figure it out from that. Yeah, you can. I mean, there, there's a there, there is a. It is more of an art than a science. Mm. Yeah. 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 I, would, I would say I, I try to make sure that I'm interpreting all that stuff in aggregate, right? I'm not I'm not going to be making radical changes in a game just because one player put their head in their hands one time. Right. Right. I'm looking for for patterns across multiple plays or between mm -hmm. multiple players, right? And trying to trying to build up little little bits of evidence into something that's that's analyzable and and interpretable. And I and I think that's something that you know lots of designers are doing, right? I think uh, there's, it's a common kind of refrain that you, you shouldn't just make wild changes based on one comment. You want to, you want to look at multiple plays or multiple players and, and try to, you know, balance all that out. Yeah. That right. person just might not like that type of game. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, you, you throw out every game that I play tested. If you only <laughs> used one person's, uh, behavioral cues. <laughs> yeah. Jesse gets a harump face and he, he, he yeah, no, I never <laughs> look like I'm having fun. The heavy side. Even you're like, I loved it. No, that, you know, it is true, though. As much as it's great to watch someone the entire way through, it's really interesting if you, especially if you thought you understood what they were feeling, and then when they go to explain it, you're like, huh, that wasn't yeah. what I was reading at all. Yeah, and that's that's super important, too. And that's a lot of what I try to do in my post-game sessions is what we call mirroring. So... I have an understanding of what you've experienced and I'm going to mirror that back to you and say, you know, uh, about halfway through the game, you said out loud and I'll often write down quotes. Uh, it felt like I, I wasted that turn, right? Uh, you know, what, what kinds of things were you feeling in that moment? Uh, and I'll, I'll try to put players in a context that I can confirm, you know, on my, my side, I'm like, okay, they're, they're frustrated, but I want to confirm with them that that's what they were feeling. Uh, and so there's there's a lot of opportunity to use those kinds of mirroring or probing questions to get a deeper understanding of your player's experience. That's, it does sound like it's like an, like an overall thing. I think it's one of those things that you have to train yourself on. Like, obviously, the longer you get into it or depending on your background, uh, you're going to be paying more attention. That I'm wondering if there's a way to almost slowly help train people to look for these cues. Uh, because again, they're not going to go take courses on it <laughs> per se, uh, that it'd almost be interesting if there was a way to sort of like, uh, it, it maybe introduce the concept more, uh, to people who are just getting into design. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping there, there will be some more formal resources out there. Uh, there is a really great, uh, book out by people who are applying these kinds of qualitative practices in the video game industry. Uh, it's called Games User Research, uh, and I, I highly recommend that because uh, it is specific about running playtests, and not everything translates into board games perfectly, uh, but the people who wrote that book are, are far more qualified than me to be talking about these kinds of things. Um, you know, and it's, it's weird, too, because, I, again, I, I don't want to try to always hold myself out as, as an expert on these things, right? Like, I, I know how to do them, but that doesn't mean that I'm necessarily qualified to be teaching other people how to do them, right? It's like, if I was if I was a welder, that doesn't mean I'm qualified to teach welding. Um, it no, just means but I can do welding. But as, as an yeah. example of someone who <laughs> might not know anything about welding, you're already gonna put me on a path or a thought process that I wouldn't have been on before. So don't discredit yourself in any way. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Also remember where we started here, right? <laughs> the games industry is not professionalized, which means exactly. yeah, which anybody is, who which stands is up is qualified to teach. Yeah, if you just um, take on the <laughs> responsibility. Yeah, yeah, I mean, and in some ways, right? That's uh, that's something. So uh, that book is, by the way, available on Amazon. Um, it's you know uh, forty dollar, forty one dollar U.S. book, uh, twenty four dollars on Kindle. Uh, but it very much will be the type of things that you're looking for in terms of UX. So they, it is a book about user experience and uh, qualitative research into that. 
Well, probably plus some quantitative stuff in there as well. But yeah. Um, I also really like, I mean, we, we can maybe, if we want to circle back to like learning resources at some point too, sure. I really like the, uh, the little book of design research ethics, which is by the design uh, firm IDEO, who runs a lot of design research for their client. Um, and it's a, it's a really good one because it's, you know, I, I sometimes worry when I talk about these things that I come across as like really preachy. And I think they do a really great job of not being preachy about it. They're just like, here's our approach. Here's why we think it's better for our clients and why it's better for our participants that we follow these things. Um, and here's some different steps we've taken. And here's some different cases that we've, you know, it goes into some examples of, of how they perform their research in an ethical way. And I think it's, I think it's really awesome. Um, little it's called little book. little book of design research ethics yeah it's it's very and it's very short too uh it's like 60 pages or something yeah, so you could read that in a minute um <laughs> well, he's a great he's, he's still in that it. mode he's still in that mode <laughs> yeah uh, so i think that, that sounds like a good one too to, to look into um, could you on our question list, Jesse? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm just, I'm trying to leave space for you guys to. But anyway, <laughs> I'm not. Really fine. I'm, I always worry I'm like talk, I'm talking too much. So you're no, the you're no, the one who should be that. talking. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So the, so I guess this you said this is this is industry week. Are there there kind of other kind of broader trends in the industry that you're you're talking about things that you're thinking about? Why don't we talk um, a bit more about development then? Because that's definitely something that the average designer won't be into until further down potentially in their career. Um, it's also something that if a new designer is just getting in with a publisher, they might not necessarily know how the developing process works and yeah. just have so, warning not all publishers have developers. Yeah. <laughs> if anyone so doesn't know that. <laughs> Yeah. So Sen's actually the, the question that Sen wanted to ask you is a perfect transition question. Um, and in case Sen doesn't remember, can you tell us about the differences between design and development and which do you prefer and why? Ooh. Oh, okay. This, that, um, so I, you know, uh, the, the answer is both of those role, roles are very different place to place. So I think anything that I say, you're going to find an example of a developer who's done the thing I've said the design did and the, a designer who's done the thing that you say, I say the developer does. But in general, uh, I view the distinction of the roles as this. The developer uh, comes up with the the concept and a, a, a vision for the game and then refines that vision into a playable prototype. Uh, and how refined that prototype is varies very widely developer to developer or designer sorry designer to designer and publisher to publisher um at some point and this is again and this is in the kind of traditional um like de designer signs the game to a publisher relationship right self-publishing can be a little different uh you know then the designer is going to sign a contract to license the rights to that game to a publisher and now the publisher is going to produce this game uh, but that doesn't mean the game is 100% ready for market. Uh, and that's where the developer comes in. So then I view the role of the developer as refining the prototype game into a marketable product. And, and that includes more than just changing the game mechanisms. Uh, a lot of what I view as the distinction is that as a developer, my job is all about audience. I'm thinking about who are the people uh, that this game is for and what are they gonna like about it? And I'm tweaking it with the audience in mind because once I have a publisher, I know who that publisher's target market is. Uh, and that might be their existing market, or it might be that this is a product that they're going to try to capture a new market with, right? They're, they're shifting markets or gaining new audience. And so a lot of what I focus on is making the game the best it can be for the people that I think it's supposed to be for, or the publisher thinks it's supposed to be for. Um, yeah. So hopefully that and inside that there's a bunch of different things, right? That can be that can be mechanical balancing, tweaking, right? Like I've done kind of big, big math models where I'm trying to balance all the victory points in a midway euro game, uh, but it can also be you know coming up with weird component ideas. Uh, you know, what if we had a big 3D chipboard cart that moved around the board because people like seeing a, a giant chipboard cart move around the board. So you're giving um, you're giving kind of like visual design suggestions on top of it, or component design suggestions. 
Yeah, and I'm and I'm not responsible for the the end art or the end graphic design, but I I view uh, I or I should say I don't have control of the final art or graphic design, uh, but I view a lot of of design and a lot of development as kind of the idea of responsibility without control. Right, I'm responsible for making sure that this is a great product, even if I don't control ninety percent of what goes into it. So that's actually a really good question too. And I know this is going to vary from company to company you work with, but what do you find your relationship with the designer is then? Um, so my, my goal is I, I want the designer to trust me to make their game better. And I want the publisher to trust me to make their product better. So uh, ideally, right when I start a project as a developer, I have about a, a 30 minute to an hour long phone call with the designer where I try to understand what their history with the game is, what they think is special about the game, uh, what, they, what they've encountered as the most fun, you know, their history of working uh, their, own, their own games to completion. And that's gonna help me when I go, and usually that call happens after I've played the game, uh, you know, one to three times. So I, we can talk in kind of a shared language about the game. Mm -hmm. uh, and the goal of that call is twofold. One is I'm I'm learning, right? I'm I'm understanding the history of the project because up when I start, the designer knows their game way better than I know their game, um, and that's sometimes still true by the end of the process, and sometimes <laughs> it's not. Um, but I'm trying to learn from them about about their game, and then the second is I'm trying to build their trust in me because I am going to make changes. Uh, I think it is possible, but rare, uh, that a game could come in development and I say, no, it's perfect. It's it's awesome. Um, and I, I honestly wonder if a perfect game came to me, would I, would I even be able to know? Because there's such a strong cognitive bias to people to want to change to things change anyway. To change something? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to fit your thumb in the pie. <laughs> um, and so, you know, so I want to build their confidence in me. Right, and then depending on the the project and the schedule, I'm going to have regular contact with them through the process. But it might not be super frequent. Every time I change something, I don't reach out to the designer and say, "Is this change okay?" I might make a change and then test it and say, "Hey, I've been testing this thing and it seems like it's pretty good." Or I've been testing this set of things, right? And you know, it'll be two, three weeks, and I'll say, "Okay, I did a rework on this and a rework on this, and here's here's some updates. What do you think about it?" Right. Um, and you know, I want to say I also design games too. Uh, that's not what how I pay my rent, but I also like to design, and I've been on the other side of this equation too. Uh, and I think that the publishers that I've enjoyed working with the most actually aren't reaching out to me about every little thing as a designer. I think I, as a designer, I want to trust that my publisher is going to put their own professional skills to work to make the mm -hmm. game great, and so. You know, uh, TMG, uh, Tasty Minstrel Games, is a publisher who I have a really, a lot of respect for their development staff. And working with them has been awesome. You know, every, you know, month or six weeks or so, they send me an email and say, hey, like, here's what's going on. Like, we, we tried these things. Uh, you know, here's a, a draft of the cover art. And I'm like, great, that's cool. But they're not, you know, every single time they change something, sending me an email saying, we updated this card, right? That's good. Yeah. Well, so I have a quick question though, as a follow up mm -hmm. then is, and this is definitely a debate. I think this is even like a Facebook conversation topic at one point is Kent Merwood group. Do you develop your own games or would you prefer someone to develop them for you? Um, yeah, well, so I think there's, there's sort of two questions wrapped up in that one, right? So one is, is the process of a designer uh, refining their own game through playtesting is that considered development? And I think there's there's some arguments on on both sides, right? Because some some designers kind of hear the description of what I do as a developer and like ah, so I'm I also develop my own games. And I think yes yes and no. Um, I think that the shift in development comes as soon as the game is is being prepared to go to market. Then it's pro then it then it's development, right? Um, so if I'm developing this, if I'm designing a game and I don't know whether it's going to come out or not, then I would consider that mostly still on the design side. Um, but then, if a if a publisher signed to that game and I was keeping working on it, I might consider that work as a designer development. 
So you don't uh, think, I, yeah. As I say, so then you don't think that a critical piece of development is the independence of the developer from the project's inception. I think it's uh, it's part of what makes having an outside developer valuable. Uh, so, you know, I I personally want an outside developer on all of my titles because I find it valuable to have an outside uh, person who's as professionally invested in the success of the product as uh, as I am, um, as the, as the designer. And so that's, you know, I do think that I want that, but I don't think that's required for it to be considered development. Hmm. Um, that's fair. Fair, fair, fair. Uh, I, so, I, yeah, so, I, I agree as well that I would like an outside developer me on too. everything. Yeah. <laughs> you know and, what it is? Yeah. Like yeah. fresh eyes, fresh eyes, guys. I think yes. it's a good thing. And I, I also agree, John, that um, my personal preference is um, designers design and developers develop. And if you're going to be a developer, go develop for a little while and then come back. Um, you know, emailing me every day about something means that I'm designing it again or I'm developing it again. And that's not what I want. I want somebody, uh, you know, if it's balanced, go go do the pluses and the minuses. Like go to the plus one, minus one to things. You can do that. I give you free reign to do that. Um, if you're changing something mechanically, that's when you need to come talk to me. The conversation. Right? But other than that, I think, you know, a good developer should be able to make some of those balance changes. That's, that's kind of what you're getting paid for. So... Yeah, yeah, kind of collect all of those confirmations that you want to and send them all together or something like that. Yeah. yeah. And I think and, and I think you, you, you got to this when you were talking about how you start the development process with the conversation with the designer. But I think a great developer moving up from a good developer is actually capable of making core system changes in a way that the designer is not going to recoil to mm -hmm. because they understand what the designer was going for and what they see as the heart and what makes the game special. So I'm actually really happy to hear that that's how you start your process. I think that's absolutely critical. Yeah. Um, and and I will say that there are projects that I I am working on that we've made some pretty major system changes during development. Uh, and that's, you know, and it's not every project, but you have to be able to look at audience reactions and say, this is this is where this this needs to go as as a product, and I have a very testing focused process, obviously, as as we talked about. And so when I go to communicate that back to the designer, if there is going to be a major change, I do so by talking about what players feel when they play the game and why I'm making that that change. So I try not to make those those kinds of changes based on my own theoretical knowledge of the market because I, you know. There, I probably could do that in some cases, uh, but I try to always root everything back to the player experience, and I think that also helps because most most designers are are cool, awesome people who care about their players having a fun time. And so when you when you present things as about the players, uh, it helps them pay attention to something that maybe they otherwise would have dismissed out of hand. Yeah, and I mean, it's also much harder to argue with data than it is to argue with an opinion. Um. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, this is this is a, actually I, I like this question from from David right now, uh, which mm -hmm. is, uh, do you ever walk away from developing a game? And David, we might actually also circle back to market categories at some point. If not, I can just post them in the comments. Um, so yeah, I am I am particular about the projects I take on. Uh, right now, my my consultancy is is one person. It's me, and then occasionally I hire subcontractors as if projects are growing in scope. Um, and so how often do I walk away from developing a game? Uh, over the last year, I've turned down about five projects. Um, and, you know, I've only done about nine now in the last year or so. So uh, it's actually pretty often. Um, and the, the major reasons I would walk away from a, a game, um, I find the... I. I find the core concept of the game not intriguing or or potentially offensive, right? So that might be a, it's not necessarily an ethical reason I would walk away, but uh, you know, so for example, an adult party game that relies on shock humor, uh, that doesn't necessarily fit my personal brand, uh, mm -hmm. and so I'm I'm not saying that that's a, a morally bankrupt thing to be making a game like that. Uh, I'm just saying that I personally don't want a game like that representing me and representing the work that I do. 
Uh, so I would turn down a project like that. I also turn down projects that I don't think I can do a professional job on. Uh, so currently, I don't accept work to work on uh, tabletop role playing games. Um, that's probably going to change in the future. Uh, you know, I, I actually self published a role playing game last year, and I really enjoy them. But just right now, I don't have the resources to be able to test them in the way that I would want to be able to test them. Mm -hmm. uh, and I and similarly, I don't work on children's games. Uh, I'll work on family games that are intended to be played by adults and children together. But I don't work on games that are exclusively for children because I don't have uh, the resources to be able to really test them with children and with the families in a in a kind of professional ethical way, uh, not the way that I do to test core hobby market games. So it's not so much that you don't want to; it's more that you feel like you're not structurally set up for it yet. Right, um, and there and there might be games that are too much work for me to take on. Right, uh, if if you came to me with something like a like a Gloomhaven, like a legacy um, game, right? <laughs> or a, yeah, I might I I might take on a legacy game depending on the, the structure of it. And if I thought it was an in, intriguing piece, um, but uh, you know, I, they're, they're really challenging. Uh, and mm -hmm. if you, I don't know if, if you've had a JR Honeycutt on the show ever to talk. Oh yeah. Um, but you know, so he, uh, Waitress Games is him and Brian Neff, right? They're a two person team and play testing through some, some legacy games that they've worked on sounds like that's been stretching stretching them to their limits as two people. So I can't even imagine as one person. Yeah, it would definitely be, it's one of those things where anytime you can't use the same play test group twice, this was a big discussion we had with our escape room one, is when you're always looking for a fresh audience, right? Or you have to maintain a certain audience. There's a lot of problems that kind of come with that or it, complications, I should, I should mm -hmm. say. Yeah. Um, and and the thing that, that is nice is I, I try to have multiple projects and in, in flight at the same time, which I all of you do too. Um, and so that's a that's a good one to, you know, I can't use the same group for the same project, but sometimes I can go back to a group that's already played one project and they can play a second project or a third project. You can have a rotation maybe, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's not the easiest thing to get a play test group, people. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean for like you you know. So I wanted to ask, um, John, how are you paying your playtesters? Are you, do you have a budget for playtesting? Um, so typically, no, my playtesters aren't played. Sometimes they get non-monetary compensation. So, um, uh, you know, I might be buying a meal uh, or providing drinks or snacks. Um, most, uh, and this again, kind of goes back to uh, professionalization stuff too. Honestly, one of the only reasons that it is cost effective to hire developers right now is that pay testers aren't played. If I paid all of my play testers, I don't think most publishers could afford to hire me. That's a um, good point. And 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 that's that's terrible because I think actually play testers do provide kind of valuable voluntary labor and sure. most of the time they're they're excited about doing it. And and that kind of ties back to some of the ethical stuff, right? They're they're there as volunteers that are are kind of doing work for me, right? <laughs> And so that's a, that's another reason that I need really need to respect them and respect their time. Yeah. Um, I have I do occasionally hire like development subcontractors that are essentially paid play testers, uh, right. and that happens when I'm on rush projects that have a really specific deadline. And so because I can't just slot those play tests in wherever I need them to be in my schedule, they need to be done in three weeks or four weeks. I'll hire someone and I pay them uh, kind of fifteen dollars an hour to play the game back to back to back to back to back to back. So right. I did this uh, a couple weekends ago on a project and I paid them to uh, play with another person. They sat down and they played 16 games in a row and no normal person, if you were not paying them, would play 16 <laughs> games in a no. row no. on the same no, day. No. That's um, not normal. <laughs> like even, even if they loved the game, right? They might play it twice in a row or three times in a row and then three play most. it the next day. Yeah. <laughs> um, 16 times in a row, it's like you have to, you know, to get that level, you have to be compensating them somehow. Yeah, we we actually do compensate our playtesters, so um, we build that into our budget. But we're not charging much hourly for our rates, so because we want to be able to play uh, pay our playtesters, so we have to figure that out somehow if it's going to be a viable thing across a longer yeah. term. But it is. Do you mean you as a developer, or you as a designer? Yeah. No, us as the developers. Like I, that get, makes way more sense. I just when we get a development that. budget, when we get a development budget, we are we are um, like when I price it out, it's say, like, okay, how many players, how many hours, how many times? 
do you want that played? And they'll say, oh, you know, it's a, a four to six player game and we'd love you to play like eight times. I say, really? Because, <laughs> you know, that's going to cost how many, if it's an hour game and six players, that's 150 bucks um, per game played. So uh, we need yeah. to really work on that. <laughs> But I, I think the thing is, though, that we need to value our resources. Otherwise, they are not going to be our resources anymore, right? So, Yeah. Um, and I will say I also get some some kind of uh, compensated labor in another way, which is de designer playtesting meetups where yeah. uh, they play... Uh, I, they play my game and I play their game and we're essentially trading labor. Uh, but that's I, I view that a little differently from my consumer playtesting, and it's it is valuable, but it's valuable in a different way than when I play with real players, mm -hmm. uh, because there I'm I'm focused on not real players. Sorry, no, I'm yeah. sorry, you're, you're not. You're, 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 you're I'm not even sure the you're difference a real person. between designer <laughs> designer feedback and playtesting oh, feedback are yeah, not the same. Yeah. yeah, right. So sorry, sorry, I interrupted you. What are you looking for when you're playtesting with designers? Um, so designers don't necessarily represent the target audience for my game, right? And so that's, yes. sometimes they are, but often they are not. Uh, but what they, they do have is insight into the way games work and uh, knowledge of the industry and knowledge of trends. And so I'm looking at it much more like, like peer feedback of a design, right? So these are my peers, these are my colleagues, and they have knowledge that's going to help me become better. Uh, and so I'm looking less at some of the kind of emotional reactions, uh, though I'm still looking at them, and more at uh, how, do, how do they approach the game? What kinds of choices are they making in the game? Uh, the discussion section might be a lot longer on, uh, I might ask different kinds of questions. Like I might ask them who they thought would enjoy the game, uh, which is a question that average consumers have a, a hard time answering. Uh, but a designer might look at the game and say, "Ah, oh, this is this is a game for these kinds of people." Uh, so, in in general, I actually have kind of a less, uh, almost like a less formal approach when I test with designers because I'm I'm there with with my peers, and it's I'm not concerned as much about kind of completely capturing a consumer experience. I'm I'm more concerned about uh, like, hey, you know, tell me tell me what you think of this as another person with with industry knowledge, and and that's neither. And I think there, there are some people who are like, that's like, so, you know, testing with designers is so much better than testing with consumers. I'm like, well, not, not really. They're just valuable in, in different ways. And I wouldn't want to test a game to completion with either, right? Like only testing with designers or only testing with consumers. Because mm -hmm. I, do, I do occasionally, like after many tests with, uh, with real players, I'll take it designers and be like, they'll find some huge structural flaw and I'll be like, and, and that's really important because eventually when the game comes out, you know, the game is going to get played more in its first month after release than all my play tests. So addressing things at a structural level uh, is is really important versus just A-B, the kind of A-B testing, play testing everything to completion. Right. We have another question from our audience. Brad Batchelor asks, does it take an intimate knowledge of component costs to be a developer? How much does that factor into the development cycle? What do you think, John? Um, I don't think an intimate knowledge is necessary, right? Uh, I'm not responsible for quoting out our games to manufacturers from from different, uh, you know, for different publishers. Um, so it's not it's not that I'm necessarily responsible for finding everything to be the most cost effective, uh, but knowing knowing general component costs to keep in mind uh, helps you come up with new ideas, right? If I know that. For example, uh, chipboard punch sheets are pretty cheap to make custom dies for, for a game. Uh, and I can put a lot of cardboard components in weird shapes into a game uh, without too much cost. I might say, hey, we could do this really cool thing that would be too expensive if we made a big plastic miniature mold. But if we do it in cardboard, now it's going to be you know, totally within the budget. Uh, so it's more knowing component costs more helps kind of uh, justify suggestions that I might make to the publisher more than it's going to be the the kind of the core function of, of the job. Um, but that, that said, I, I do try to kind of uh, do some research on that and keep up to date as new manufacturing techniques and that kind of stuff come out. Because I do think it, it helps me as a developer uh, when I can go back to clients and suggest really, really cool new components. Uh, so uh, this is one we haven't actually 
I don't even know that we have any photos of this, but it's public. Uh, the next role player expansion, uh, ROLL player, is called Fiends mm -hmm. and Familiars. And each role player expansion introduces a new type of dice. So in the first expansion, they're called boost dice. Uh, and they are six-sided dice that go three to eight, and they're pipped dice. Um, and for the next role player expansion, uh, we're going to be doing uh, what we're calling split dice. And these are dice that are actually two colors. Uh, and the color of the die matters in role player drafting for a lot of different effects. And so, you know, because of the fact that I knew that you could actually make these dice, uh, because there are people who are already making them for other uses like RPGs, I was able to go back to Keith, who's the publisher of role player, and say, hey, like this would be a really cool new type of die for our next expansion, because not only will people get excited about it, it's really cool. Uh, kind of feel and look and visual on the table, but it also solves a really important game balancing problem that I've been having. So uh, knowing that these components are out there helps you kind of provide suggestions, provide, provide feedback. Yes. Um, so we, we just, a just bunny. <laughs> sorry, he so desperately wants to be on my lap. I'm just not letting him. Um, all um, right, sorry about that. No, I, I, they, yeah, sorry. No, but I think it's a really good point. And so just like as a quick sum up, the idea is like you don't necessarily need to know component costs and production to be developing, but it can definitely help and even come up with partial solutions to things as you go along. Yeah. Um, and I think that's true as a designer too, right? If you, uh, I, I think it, the, the competition is fiercer than ever for your game's kind of mind share in, in people's minds. And so if you have a really cool idea for a component as a designer, even though the final components aren't ne necessarily your responsibility, I think being able to put that out there as part of your pitch of like, it's gonna have really cool table presence because it's gonna have this thing in it. Uh, that's, a, that's a leg up for you as a designer too. Yeah, I will say, especially because New York Toy Fair was just the past weekend, and it's the rare exception that they're the few people who don't necessarily worry as much about production issues, because, you know, they don't really have issues with plastic. But if I had pitched most of the same games to Hobby, the first thing would have been, this is too expensive. Uh, yeah. And it, it is a consideration. So if you really do want to use something like that's cool and unique in your game, and you get to the point where you realize that that's probably the first thing that's going to be said is, I don't know if we can produce this. If you really want this game to be produced with that component, you might want to do a little bit of research and say, oh, well, there's actually a factory in this that does it for this. Or, hey, did you know that this already exists here? Because all of a sudden it becomes possible to them. Because the minute they have to do all that extra work into like researching this component piece, yeah. that's so much more time and effort to and I hate to say it, unless I absolutely are diehard for the game, it's kind of like, well, then it's an easy yeah. no. It's not such an easy no when you could tell yeah. them how to get the component made. That's right. So mm -hmm. just a little word of yeah. advice. <laughs> yeah, or uh, one of the things I also like is is sourcing components, right? The idea that if, if most hobby publishers, their print run is not going to be super large. So I really like the website Alibaba, which is uh, like a wholesale marketplace. For the and world. Yes. if you can, <laughs> if you can find a really weird board game <laughs> component on Alibaba, uh, you can have your a lot of manufacturers subcontract and just say like buy it from here and ship it to your factory and put it in the box. So mm -hmm. things like uh, uh, pre-painted toys, right? So like let's say you're making a game about dinosaurs, making a custom dinosaur miniature for all the dinosaurs in your game uh, is probably prohibitively expensive, especially if they're pre-painted. Uh, but you could source pre-painted plastic dinosaurs for cheaper than you could get a custom unpainted dinosaur made. Oh, yeah. Um, pennies, pennies, pennies. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. Especially if it already scale, exists in China yeah. or India or something like that. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, you can, there's some weird things you can do that I think uh, companies aren't always necessarily taking advantage of. So I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing more board games. Uh, that start having kind of these weird toy components Dinosaurs. that are basically sourced from toy manufacturers mm -hmm. and not custom for the game. Hmm. Like non-custom miniatures, like the re almost the reverse. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's true. Because, I mean, think of it this way. How many designers go to the dollar store <laughs> to find 
parts. And funny enough, if it's available at the dollar store, then it means it's available for mass purchase from a publisher. It, so like, yeah, some of these connections I think are just starting to be made, but I, I think it, if you, especially if you're gonna pitch someone who maybe is a little bit smaller, has never been in doing component pieces like that, if you do a little bit of legwork, if you're able to, obviously, uh, it might go really far because I, I won't lie. I've actually now met a publisher that actually is looking for people to have already priced out the game before you bring it to them. Wow. That Ooh. I've heard. I've heard that. That's so I will job. say that that's not going to be me. <laughs> yeah, I, I promise you right now, I'm not doing that. But this is an expectation of a publisher. So they might huh. not necessarily be the only ones who are starting to think down that line. So it's just something to put out there. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, wow. When you know, yeah. Yeah. No. Keep going. I was saying, and you know, a, a lot of times, if if you pitch with a sell sheet, which we had a long discussion about whether sell sheets are, are worth or not the other day too. Um, yes. Um, eh. uh, if you do pitch with a sell sheet, one of the first things the publisher does, they like basically do a little mental calculation of like they're trying to price it out based on the components you list in your sell sheet, right? See, I list those on the rules. They can get the yeah. rules. Yeah, <laughs> um, I'll be honest, guys. I don't make sell sheets. I'm probably a weirdo. I don't. No. I, I make I, crazy components and rule books. I don't know. I, honestly, I advocate for shell, sell sheets. But if you look at, if you followed me around at Gen Con, you would realize that instead, I just have a bag. I have clear plastic bags with my games, and I have them like vacuum sealed in the Ziploc bags, so they are a sell sheet. So I can just pull them out and be like, here's the most important bit. Let me say, tell you how I, it works. I show you the whole game. You yeah, no, I mean, it. we have sell sheets. Jesse has sell sheets for everything too. Well, I, I used to. Yeah. First gen not, con I did. They're not, they're not super complex because yeah. they don't have to be, right? Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, that's, that's a little bit beyond development. Uh, yeah, but that's right. we are running out of time. So uh, John, at the end of every show, we like our guests to give out one piece of advice um, from their perspective to new designers uh, or just designers in general. Uh, so as a developer, um, what is, or at, from a ethics perspective maybe, what is one piece of advice you'd like to see um, designers follow to make your job easier? Um, so as, as, a, as, a, as a designer, I think uh, before your game goes to the publisher, uh, think really hard about what is special about your game right and there's and i think there's that's a lot of a lot of people give this advice right For, like find the magic find the fun in your game and then think about who else in the world is going to look at your game and find that special thing about it um because that's those are going to be the the kind of the first things that i'm going to ask you uh as a as a developer uh and the first things that i'm going to be looking for as a developer when I go to start playtesting your game. And so if you can communicate those things clearly, you're not only gonna have a better relationship with your developer, you're also probably gonna have an easier time finding a publisher for that design. Mm. Yeah, all yeah. very good. That's and really good I mean, that really links nicely to things we talk about in terms of your 30 second you know, elevator pitch. You gotta be able to tell them the magic, that, that hook instantly. And yeah. then we talk about that with table presence as well, that that's what should be showing. You've got to show them the hook. You can't let it hit them in the face blindside. You've got to say, that's what it is right there. That's what you want. That's why you want this game. It's right there. Um, cool. So uh, let's just think about what's happening in next week for us, Erica. Well, we have a whole list. Oh, do we, our, is our game officially been selected yet? No, uh, we have one game. Uh, and we have the second game being uh, judged right now. So the first game uh, of the of the that might be what we go into a deep dive with the pandemic. Matt, it's pandemic, Matt right? Leacock. I thought so. Matt Leacock's pandemic. And then right now, there's currently a poll on the Meeple Syrup Show page that is all about um, Ticket to Ride versus King of Tokyo. So we could go Garfield on this hand or we could go mood on this hand. So you let us know what you'd like to see us uh, compete, put up against Pandemic, and then we'll do the winner of Pandemic versus whatever game you pick over the next couple days. So uh, on that note, uh, we're gonna say goodbye to everybody tonight. It is just after 10 
And hopefully next week we'll have be live set up properly so we can push out a message to everybody that the show's starting in five minutes, et cetera, et cetera. Just didn't happen today because of some technical difficulties. So thanks very much to John for coming on. Uh, thanks to Jesse and Erica for all the awesome questions. Thanks to everybody watching. Uh, you had wonderful questions today. And if you'd like to reach out to John on Twitter, it's at Das Brieger. D A S P R. That is me. The comments. Check the comments. Check the comments. B R I G E R. There you go. B R I E G E R. And and yes, that is that is generally going to be the best way to reach out to me if you have you know random questions about things I talked about or random questions about things we didn't touch on. And follow for the playtesting. Daily playtesting tips. Dave, daily playtesting yeah. tips. Cool. Um, also, um, Erica, are you going to PoopaCon? I don't know. I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. I, I my, fa my, I, my family wants me to be home. Yeah, I've been asked to go to something else that we. <laughs> they like so miss know. me and stuff. And yeah, like, right. It's hard to no, balance. I was, just, I was just wondering because I in the feed in the comments people were saying, you know, how they like to see playtesting and they'd love to see somebody who's good at. Uh, playtesting, run a playtest session. So uh, we might need to record some of those or development Break sessions and things like that because people seem to be interested. So. You know what? It's always yeah. it's always good to you know it's always good to just observe other people. I have to yeah. say we're very very lucky in I'll say Ontario. It's really Toronto, but I'll say Ontario. There's so many of us, and we're mm -hmm. so lucky we have access to each other. I mean, as designers, developers, everything. We don't really have publishers, but we have a lot of everything else. <laughs> and it's just really nice that we have a lot of access to each other because it is it does speed things up significantly. Yeah. And yeah. if we do right. take video, we will get everybody's consent. <laughs> yes. Right. Okay, yes. Cool. If you learn All anything right. from this. All right. Informed consent. Informed um, consent. Enthusiastic informed consent. And then one other quick note, um, if you are watching this and you haven't joined or uh, the Meeple Syrup Shop Talk group on Facebook, um, find that group through the Facebook page and join us. Um, lots of- John, are you on that page? Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and th there've been some good good discussions in there. Uh, I Excellent. try to respond when I have things that I think add to the conversation, so. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, it's a little different than some of the other pages, but it's good. We like it. <laughs> Yeah. It's for Excellent. the questions people want to ask. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. So we'll see everybody next week. I'll get all the technology stuff fixed up and maybe buy a new microphone. I don't know what my kids did, so <laughs> they broke it. But yes, we'll see you all later. All right. Good night. Bye. Bye. Cheers. Thank you for watching the Meeple Syrup Show. If you'd like to help support our show and the podcast, please visit www.patreon.com backslash Meeple Syrup. Thank you for your support.